There are 134 companies, to be exact, that are exposed to this. And um, obviously, we, we mentioned Solana, we can get What do you mean by exposed? Hello everyone, today our guest is Megan Nilsson, known as Crypto Megan. Crypto Megan, also known as Megan Nilsson, is a crypto consultant and educator. In this interview, Crypto Megan talks about how she understood the FTX and Sam Bankman Fried's Ponzi scheme and fraud, and explains the details while predicting about the crypto space's future. If you enjoy this highlight videos, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you. Sheila Baer, a top U.S. regulator during the 2008 financial crisis, explained in an interview with CNN Monday that there are eerie similarities between the rise and fall of FTX and former CEO Sam Bankman-Fried and that of Bernie Madoff. Baer chaired the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation from 2006 to 2011. She now sits on the board of directors at blockchain infrastructure firm Paxos. She explained that both Bankman Fried and Madoff proved adept at seducing sophisticated investors and regulators into ignoring red flags hiding in plain sight. FTX filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy last week, and Bankman Fried stepped down as the CEO. Charming regulators and investors can distract them from digging in and seeing what's really going on, Baer described. Madoff ran the largest Ponzi scheme in history, worth about $64.8 billion. He promised investors high returns, but rather than investing, he deposited their money into a bank account and paid, upon request, from existing and new investors' funds. Convicted of fraud, money laundering, and other related crimes, he was sentenced to 150 years in federal prison. Madoff died in prison on April 14 last year at the age of 82. And that's the whole issue that's happened with FTX, is that they're running FTX like a bank, a fractional reserve system. And, you know, banks are allowed to leverage up to 90% of people's deposits, and he's been running his exchange like that. And when you build a company on leverage in crypto, I mean, to just to, so he built this company on leverage based on his reputation and being too big to fail all the way up to the highest ranks. I mean, Kevin O'Leary was his spokesperson based on his reputation and, and got all the way there. And he did this because he wanted to take over the competition. So when you build a company like that and not, you know, with a long-term vision and community in mind and just a shotgun approach, things go wrong. And so, you know, he did this whole thing that's called like the flywheel approach. He creates a token out of thin air, right? He prints money just like the Fed <laughs> and the US dollar. You can print the money, there's no limit to it. Then he shows, he pumps the token. He shows the gains to investors on the balance sheet raises money from the investors and then takes that money from the investors and leverages it to buy more companies. And so you can see that this model is in essence a Ponzi scheme that works in a bull market. But when bear market comes and certain prices are hit at liquidation price, in this case it was around $22, hence the tweet from Caroline from Alameda Research reaching out to CZ, begging him pretty much to buy those coins over the counter because he said he was gonna sell, sell all of his positions in FTT. Uh, if that happens, then the whole thing collapses. And it's just so wrong. He misappropriated about $4 billion in users funds alone to try to save his failing hedge fund. And that's just so unethical. And the problem is a bank, when they have a bank run and the bank can't produce the money that, it, that the people are demanding because there's too many at once, they get bailed out by the U.S. dollar. But exchanges aren't backed by the U.S. dollar and they don't have proof of funds as of now. So there's no transparency there. In this case, he's taking users' funds and leveraging it. I mean, pure gambling. The only way this works is through this Ponzi scheme. And the banks do it at least backed by the reserve in the U.S. dollar. Sure. So if something goes wrong, they can get bailed out. But if something goes wrong here and he's saying, we don't do this, we've got a runway. Well, Binance was supposed to bail them out. <laughs> Uh, well, but OK, that's another story. And yeah. I honestly don't know that he ever even intended to, because mm -hmm. imagine Binance doesn't run in the regulatory environment in the U.S. No. And Sam Bankman-Fried, I mean, it came out that he's involved in a lot of lawsuits. Binance would never take I that on. I know we're skipping, you know, we're jumping around here. But like, what was Binance's rationale or incentive to even buy out FTX or consider it? Um, you know, their excuse for backing out of the deal was that they looked at the books and there was too much stuff they didn't want to own, too much debt. Um, was that the real reason, Megan? I, I couldn't say the, the real reason, but I could speculate that partially, probably to smoke him out. 
to expose what was going on because it wasn't right, it was unethical, it was wrong, and people trusted their funds with him. I mean, if it, if it is true that Binance has a 10-year runway of cash reserves, I mean, that's how, how an exchange should operate. It, it just totally blows my mind, you know, and even the biggest holding by, by um, Kevin O'Leary himself. You know, now he's taken all his funds and gone to Canada and said, forget this, I'm not getting involved until this is regulated. I mean, I really think that his, because he had to have known they were in legal issues at that point, and Binance could never take that on because they're not in that regulatory environment in the US. So I suspect that partially some of it, like Elon Musk, right? He went in and he took a look at Twitter and he said, there's too many bots, this thing is awful. Right. And then I don't know how the contract was, whether or not he could back out. But that's what I suspect that Binance had kind of been doing. I don't know about what's going on with them. But when I see these kind of red flags, um, it starts to make me wonder, you know, where does the money come from? And there was one interview uh, with one guy from one of the news networks and, and he was talking to Sam Bigman fried and Elon Musk said it, too. He said he couldn't get a clear answer about where the funds came from. Red flag. Right. Well, yeah, so let's talk about that. Um, we were talking about the mechanics offline about uh, about how the funds are transferred. As a user of FTX, could I not see that my funds were being used on Alameda Research? Was there not, you know, because when you, when you, when you, when you transact with cryptocurrencies, with Bitcoin, for example, that transaction or movement should be posted on a ledger. Would I not see that the Bitcoins that I own are being moved around? Right. I don't think it's so apparent as of right now because it's hard to track exactly who it's coming from and where it's going. I mean, the reason why we knew that the 500 million in FTT token was that was transferred to Binance Exchange was from CZ is because he came out and said it. It was pretty much the tweet that triggered everything. I'm selling my FTT. Something's up on Alameda Research's balance sheet. I just want you guys to know we're not trying to affect the market. We'll do this slowly. Mm -hmm. Right. But then that's what triggered this whole cascading effect. And uh, um, Sam Bigman Free came out and he had the Lehman Brother moment. And he said, don't worry, we have enough capital reserves, everything will be fine. And less than 24 hours, everything was done. And so it was faster than Lehman because Lehman took three days. Oh, well, okay, well, that's uh, uh -huh. not really a record you want to be. No, no, no. It, it was the craziest thing I've ever seen in crypto history. Yeah. I mean, it was, it's the year of that could never happen. There are 134 companies to be exact that are exposed to this. And um, obviously we, we mentioned Solana, we can get- What do you mean by exposed? Yeah, we'll talk about Solana. That had some kind of exposure to FTT or, or some kind of relationship with Sam Bacon Fried or investments or, or some kind of exposure there. Um, so so Solana was, I think he owned 10% of the whole token supply, 10 or 15%. That's a lot. That's a lot on a market cap like Solana. And so it had been a, experiencing heavy sell pressure and there's all these YouTube influencers coming out saying, will Solana go to zero? I mean, you have to, you have to imagine that a lot of people that hold that token or, or if he invested in that token, they're gonna wanna get some of their returns out of that and maybe have heavy sell pressure. I know about a billion dollars was unstaked the other day is waking its way to the open market now. Yeah. Um, so I, I do believe you know, not to spread FUD or anything because I'm so optimistic on what's going to happen in the future, but I think we're in for some some little bit of rough times as the the story develops that more and more people were involved. So. I think within the actual entity, and I listened to a lot on this and did some research, and I actually know, <laughs> I do know one professional that came out and said, um, later on she asked not to have this public so we don't talk about who it is, but she said, you know, Sam Bingham Fried was responsible for the Luna collapse. And I don't know whether or not that's true, but if it is, then this has been going on for a long time. And I did hear that when the company first started, he really urged his employees to invest. Said, you're gonna get a great deal before this goes on to market. You all should take advantage of this. And so I don't think any of them knew, except for a small, tight inner circle at the top. And um, I, it's sad because a lot of them put their savings into this. I mean, employees that felt that this was gonna be the next big thing and they were excited to be on it because he was pumping it up by, I, I read this from actually an employee who put out some letters and said we all got newsletters in the beginning who was really urging us to invest in him and FTT and um, I don't think they knew. And I've heard arguments that maybe it's just a bunch of kids running a billion dollar company they had no idea what they were doing. Um, they weren't intentionally trying to deceive people, although there was probably evidence that they probably did. Um, what's your take? Is he going to jail? I find it hard to believe that it was unintentional. Okay. Um, I mean, he built it. Allegedly, he built a trapdoor, you know, to where he was funneling the funds, using them for using users' funds for to prop up his own company and to invest in FTT or whatever it was he was doing, leveraging 
On a side note, there's one quote by an anonymous source that says, if you don't know about leverage, you know nothing about crypto at all. Mm. Because this has been going on for a very long time and it's just now getting exposed on a very high level. And, and to answer your question about whether or not he'll go to jail, you know, he donated five million to Biden and I think like 20 million or 40 million to Democrats. So a lot of people have been saying that it's like Goldman Sachs, that he's paying for protection within the government. And Gary Gensler was involved with him you know, um, rallying for that. The whole reason why this came about is because Sam Bankman Free was rallying for regulation that yeah. would really benefit him. And it would kind of isolate the rest of the sector. So he was trying to monopolize. Still bearish right now, Megan? Has this made people more bearish or perhaps this signals the bottom? What do you think? I mean, on the charts, and I like to look at charts and not just sentiment and then combine the two and sure. kind of come up with a thesis, but the charts have been showing for a long time that there was already a potential bottom. And that's what I've been placing my bets on and that's how I've been acting. I've been laddering in at these areas because historically, I mean, we're, at the, we're in the golden zone, the golden zone of buying opportunities for Bitcoin. And so for me to try to time the bottom or maybe maybe there could be one more leg down or another flash crash down to 13.7, which is the strongest support level in Bitcoin history. Maybe there could be, but what does it matter to me if I've got a long-term mindset and I'm in this thing for years to come? I mean, you know, I, I have more of a set it and forget it approach for my clients. Um, and this is now for me an opportunity to buy those assets at a cheaper price, to set it and prepare for what's to come, okay. which is this massive influx of capital when we have regulation. And so to answer your question about the sentiment, I think the sentiment in, in the, the mass market, you know, the retail market is horrible because right. I know that because I'm in touch with them. But the inner Web3 circle, like I told you, we were on spaces this morning and without a hitch. I mean, these people, they're rallying behind this movement harder than ever. And they're still here. OK, OK. So you said 13.7K was the strongest support level in Bitcoin history. How, do, how, do you, how did you come up with that um, conclusion? By the monthly chart. So the most touches of support and resistance on the monthly chart. Um, there's a lot of historical uh, value there. So when I'm trying to, to, to discern, like, where could we go to? Where could we fall to if we did have another crash? Um, one of the other points, that it's called the 618 Golden Fibonacci. Yeah. It's like the the biggest support zone that Bitcoin likes to retrace to in, in these kind of markets, I believe was around uh, 11,000. Um, so, you know, well, I mean, if we did have some kind of a flash crash down to that point, I would consider it an excellent opportunity. And that's what I'm doing. And I'm planning on going forward in that. The former FDIC chair is not worried about the FTX implosion threatening the entire financial system the way Lemon Brothers did in 2008, noting that crypto is still a relatively small part of the broader economy and financial market. However, the crypto market remains largely unregulated, leaving investors vulnerable if something breaks. Bear stressed, it's time to settle on a regulatory regime for crypto and sort out who is regulating what because people are getting hurt. If you enjoy this highlight videos, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you.